uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, he is a postdoctoral fellow at the Taube Center for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, Egelonian University, Poland. Uh, his research interests uh, include nationalism and diaspora studies, memory, linguistic identities in the post-Soviet states, and the role of social media and social movements and cultural representations. And uh, his uh, recent publications appeared in Nations and Nationalism, Communist and Post-Communist Studies, and the Journal of European Studies. Uh, prior to the Gilonian University, uh, Dr. Kozachenko held research positions uh, at the Forum Transregionale in Berlin, University of Cambridge, and Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, University of Alberta, Canada. And uh, he received his doctorate in sociology from the University of Aberdeen. And I should add that uh, I know Dr. Kozachenko for many years since. Uh, uh, our collaboration or cooperation in the Vienna Karazinhart National University. So I am glad to meet him uh, on this event. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for uh, the opportunity to listen to the lecture. So, uh, more is yours, please. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction, Professor Mosiyazdov. It's great uh, to be here. So my today's talk is uh, based on two projects. One has uh, been completed and uh, uh, one is very much in progress. So I really value this opportunity uh, to present uh, the conceptual framework and, uh, and uh, to discuss some preliminary findings. I actually prepared quite a lot of uh, um uh, slides so let me share the screen okay i hope you can see uh, the slides now so uh, first of all, uh, I want uh, to say several words about um, uh, Euromaidan revolution, uh, just because my presentation will follow on the memory escapes and urban activism in Kharkiv with the focus to the period uh, prior Euromaidan and uh, changes the revolution brought to it. So uh, there are diversion uh, narratives of Euromaidan. So for instance, Sergei Kvit, uh, uh, a Ukrainian activist and also uh, uh, the person who served as Minister of Education uh, after uh, the Euromaidan uh, provides the following description of it. The Euromaidan should be treated within the context of the Ukrainian uh, people uh, national liberation struggle. It is less about interests, everyone uh, has its, uh, hers or his own and more about individuals striving to feel themselves the people in their own lands. Thus, the Euromaidan is often called the revolution of dignity. So really, this romanticized uh, vision of the event. Uh, another scholar, Volodymyr Kulik, also uh, points out that uh, the very meaning to, of belonging to Ukrainian nation has changed, uh, was changed by this revolution. So uh, it made uh, Ukrainian national identity more civic and inclusive. inclusive. And then there are uh, more downbeat uh, evaluations of this revolution. Um, a Ukrainian scholar, uh, Mikhail Minakov, uh, compares the outcomes of the Arab Spring and Euromaidan and uh, says the following, that um, the conservative revolutionary option uh, has hegemon in both areas. In post-Maidan Ukraine, ethno-nationalism, monolingualism, uh, ideological monopoly over collective memory, and radical conservative cultural and educational policies became the focus of reforms by 2017. And obviously, he stresses some negative outcomes of the Arab Spring as well. And finally, Yuri Matsyevsky provides uh, like analysis of uh, institutional change and uh, argues that, uh, uh, in fact, the core of Ukrainian hybrid regime 
and oligarchic system hasn't changed after the revolution. So his claim is that it's revolution without uh, change. And indeed, if you look at uh, various indexes and ratings, uh, not much changed after the revolution. So the focus of my research is to look at the level of the city and uh, to pay specific attention to convergence of new media memory and uh, uh, urban social change. So I argue that this may yield more, uh, more in insights and better understanding of what's uh, going on. And uh, several words about the city and some of its uh, dramatic periods. So Kharkiv, uh, the, uh, it's, the date has been contested, but uh, it is assumed it was uh, founded in the mid 17th century in 1654. Initially, it was a Cossack uh, settlement, uh, which was quite quickly absorbed by the uh, Duchy of Moscovy and uh, later in the Russian Empire. And over time, it, in, it became the center of the um, uh, Slobozhanshina, a um, macro region within the Russian Empire, which could be translated as the land of uh, free people. It has uh, one of the oldest uh, universities within the post-Soviet space. And actually, it is partly the birthplace of Ukrainian national idea, as Nikolai Kostomaro worked here and has drafted uh, one of the most important works uh, on two kinds of Russian people uh, in his language, which actually laid the foundation for Ukrainian uh, national uh, development. And also, uh, initially during the Civil War, uh, Kharkiv first became the capital of Donetsk uh, Krivorysia Republic. Uh, unlike Kiev, it's actually was quite supportive towards uh, Bolshevik uh, ideas. And later it was uh, sort of awarded with the title of the capital of Soviet Ukraine. And, uh, and this narrative of the first capital is actually quite strong and still serves as one of the pillars of uh, uh, local identity. And then in the early uh, Soviet years, uh, there was uh, really a widespread reemergence of Ukrainian uh, culture called Ukrainian Renaissance. And uh, many of the famous poets and writers and uh, directors uh, lived in uh, one house, uh, it's called the Slower House. But during the Stalin purges, uh, many of them were executed. So uh, this period in Ukrainian history always called the Ukrainian, executed Ukrainian Renaissance. And also in 1932-1933, Kharkiv was one of the centers of artificial genocidal female uh, Holodomor. So uh, Tatiana Zhurzhenko, in her research, uh, quite uh, rightly calls it the capital of despair. Actually, I will uh, return to this work a bit later. And uh, not very uh, much known uh, fact that uh, Kharkiv was one of the sites of the Katyn massacre. Uh, basically, after the uh, invasion of, the, uh, of Poland by Nazi Germany and Soviet Union, uh, tens of thousands of Polish soldiers and uh, officers were taken uh, prisoners of war by the Soviet Union, and uh, uh, many of them were executed, uh, most notably in Katyn, but also in Kiev and in Kharkiv. Also, uh, Kharkiv was the site of uh, uh, Holocaust by bullets in um, Father de Bois uh, language. Uh, as uh, in Drobetsky Yar, in the outskirts of the city, more than 16,000 uh, Jews were executed in the first years of the Second World War. And also, the city was a key place for the Russian Spring or for Russian uprisings of uh, 2014. So while all these events are important, I will focus uh, primarily uh, on the two of them uh, in terms of um, changing memory sites. So uh, executed uh, Renaissance and uh, Kati. And, and then I, I want to say several words about uh, uh, theoretical framework uh, I rely on in my studies. So first of all, it is about urban social movements. Emmanuel Castells in his uh, 
uh, the early research um, provided quite in depth of, uh, analysis of this phenomenon. In particular, he uh, argues that people who mobilize to change their city eventually uh, change the society they live in. And uh, Narek Makhtichan uh, provides a brilliant idea in his analysis of post Soviet capitals that uh, cities uh, could be and should be treated as imagined communities, which is narrated through particular memory places and architectural design. And uh, this actually uh, shaped the space where individual identities emerge and uh, asserted. And uh, in a way, all post Soviet cities are being renovated after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then important concepts of uh, cultural and communicative uh, memory, well known, uh, which were developed by Jan Asman. So, cultural memory is created mainly by elites, while communicative memory is mainly transmitted uh, or and maintained through small groups and families. Uh, and uh, these are quite uh, different types of men. And a uh, very relevant study uh, by John Nagel, uh, who analyzes Beirut and Belfast in terms of urban amnesia. So he argues that uh, this amnesia practice is quite often uh, encouraged by uh, local elites. So with uh, uh, redevelopment of areas and introducing of international brands, quite often uh, the places hide uneasy pasts uh, and avoid like reflective um, analysis of our addressing of these pasts. And uh, these ideas are also uh, relevant to the concepts of ghosts and haunting by Avery Gordon. Uh, who stresses that uh, these are memories of traumatic past that expose what's been suppressed or concealed, but very much alive and present with those uh, always incomplete forms of containment. And as we'll, I will show, there are uh, quite a lot of sites which, uh, and, and uh, periods which are relevant to goods and haunting in Kharkiv. And uh, this talk uh, is based uh, in my research, I rely on the following uh, methods. So there are several, uh, several uh, rounds of this uh, research. Uh, in order to investigate online dimension, I primarily rely on qualitative content analysis of social media groups, which, uh, which are dedicated to Kharkiv. And of course, uh, I use extensive uh, urban ethnography and uh, which includes uh, semi-structured interviews with local um, activists, politicians, scholars, and uh, journalists. So uh, let me um, uh, then point out that the developments which are taking place in Kharkiv, they actually quite closely related to uh, supranational discourses and uh, quite often these are icons of nationalism, once again, the, the concept by Manuel Castells. These are symbols which like clearly di differentiate one narrative from another. So Ukrainian national uh, discourse uh, mainly relies on post-colonial uh, ideas and presenting Ukraine as an occupied country. And uh, while there are many symbols of uh, uh, liberation struggle, I would say that the most articulate one relates to the uh, Ukrainian nationalism during the Second World War. So here, uh, the leader of uh, one wing of organization of Ukrainian uh, nationalists is very important. And also its armed wing, uh, Ukrainian insurgent army, it's uh, quite uh, contested, but very important symbol as well. And then there is symbol of Ukrainian martyrdom and, and uh, victimhood is Holodomor, it's 1933 famine, which is uh, generally as accepted as a genocide, uh, the understanding which is uh, generally contested by supranational narratives. And within those, it is possible to uh, differentiate Russophile and Sovietophile. Uh, while the for the lots of victory in the Second World War and nostalgia for the Soviet Union provide a foundation for the former one, 
it is Russian imperial symbols and Russian orthodoxy are the key things. Although they may seem uh, like contradicting each other for quite obvious historical reasons, like the, uh, the Russian uh, civil war, uh, actually they come together in very postponed ways, which I demonstrate a bit later. So let me present some illustrations of my findings. So in uh, late Soviet years, um, there were uh, memory sites uh, constructed, which actually supported quite strongly the um, national narratives. First of all, it's this cross in the Morodizhny Park, uh, which was the first, uh, the first uh, uh, monument to commemorate uh, members of Holodomor. It was uh, built in uh, 1989, and prior to this, uh, there were only monuments in the diaspora which were commemorating the events of uh, Holodomor. And then not far from there, there was the monument for the Ukrainian insurgent army. And this is the most contested uh, place uh, probably in Kharkiv overall. But in, in, in the 90s, the memory was not that much uh, the uh, mobilizing factor and uh, it, were, it were the languages and the linguistic identities which were used more. So it was the memory wars which were started after the Orange Revolution of 2005. So I mentioned the work by Tatiana Zhurzhenko about uh, Holodomor and memory politics in Kharkiv after the Orange Revolution. So there was the general struggle between the appointed by the central authorities, uh, uh, head of the regional administration, Arsen Avakov, and the local, uh, uh, leaders of the party of regions, uh, Gennady Kernas and Mikhail Dobkin, both of them served as mayors of Kharkiv at different points. So uh, Avakov tried to build a proper monument to the victims of Holodomor in the city of Kharkiv. But uh, as brilliantly noted by, by Tatiana Zhurzhenko, these efforts were prevented. So ironically, like the peasants in the 1930s, the monument could not get uh, into the city as well. So it was built near the motorway uh, to the, uh, in the direction of Russia. So this woman, the uh, figure of woman actually facing Russia. And, uh, but it was 2010 uh, when uh, Mayor Kernis, uh, May, uh, Kernis was uh, elected as a uh, Mayor, and a bit later, he actively participated in a so called anti fascist campaign by the Party of Region. The main uh, target of this campaign, locally, was uh, George or Yuri Shevelev. This is a very important figure for Ukrainian linguistics and Ukrainian national project overall. So, Shevelev was actually, uh, original name was Schneider. He was a son of um, German. Russian imperial, uh, Russian imperial officer of German background who changed his name to a more Russified one during the First World War. And uh, he lived in the central uh, Kharkiv. Uh, he hasn't evacuated uh, when the uh, Nazi Germany occupied it. And he was working as an editor of um, one of newspapers in Ukraine. You can see Gennady Kernis is holding it uh, on this picture to the left. Uh, although there are uh, no like um, uh, some texts of hatred were associated directly with the Shevelyov. And later, after, uh, during the war, he actually emigrated to the West and later became an established professor at Columbia University in the US. He was awarded the uh, honorary doctorate by uh, Kharkiv National University. So, uh, he's a widely respected figure. But based on this episode of working in this newspaper, Kennedy Kernas uh, accused him of being a Nazi collaborator. And uh, there was a plaque installed uh, on the house where Shevelyov used to, to live. So the city council uh, voted to remove this plaque and just minutes after this, it was uh, smashed. It was in 2013, just immediately, 
uh, before the year of Rwanda. Uh, and uh, Dokken and Kerenas may seem as the defenders of the Soviet past, but it's actually not the case. Uh, before the uh, uh, Euromaidan, they actually destroyed quite a lot of uh, important um, spots, which are very important for the Soviet memory and glorification of the Soviet heroes. One of them is the alley of uh, Komsomol heroes. Uh, it uh, commemorates uh, Zoya Kosmodivyansk and others, really key symbols of uh, Ukrainian like young heroes of the Second uh, World War. And uh, so it was quite brutally dismantled. And instead of it, there was a church built uh, over there. It was claimed that historically the church was there, so it's restoration of some historical balance. But of course, it's not the case. The church didn't look exactly the same and it wasn't in the same spot. So in a way, it's replacement of um, uh, Soviet symbols with uh, Orthodox ones. Another spot is the monument of, of the establishment of the Soviet rule of Ukraine. You can see it to the left. It's actually had uh, um, quite high cultural value uh, and was part on the list of Ukrainian heritage, built of uh, red granite. But uh, locals jokingly called it uh, five Karen the fridge, just because the shape of the flag uh, where the, uh, uh, the, the figures standing around it. So it was also uh, brutally dismantled, and instead of it was uh, uh, built this uh, statue of Nika on the ball, like the figure symbolizing uh, Ukrainian independence, but not possessing that much uh, meaning. But of course, the main project by Kernes, the park which probably uh, will get uh, his name at some point. It's the Gorky Park. So uh, this was the big uh, multi-million redevelopment project. And uh, instead of rundown Soviet Park, uh, the place which often called the Ukrainian Disneyland was built. And quite funny, instead of the Gorky Monument, uh, there was it, it was replaced with the uh, Monument of Squirrel. Which is, which is quite funny. And definitely instead of a uh, prominent uh, Soviet cultural figure, <laughs> the squirrel doesn't, uh, has, uh, doesn't have much meaning at all. So this is like really shows this amnesia practices and uh, uh, projects which were uh, helped and uh, implemented by Cairns, uh, who discursively always supported the Soviet heritage and the memory of the Second World War. And of course, uh, then there is Hero Maidan. And while the main protests were taking place in um, uh, Kiev, uh, Kharkiv became also at some point at the very end of the protest became very important as well. So after the protesters were massacred in uh, Kiev Maidan Square on 18th and 20th uh, of uh, February 2014, uh, Mikhailo Dobkin, who was uh, head of regional administration at the time, organized a meeting called the Eastern Front. This meeting brought the most prominent figures and of, of uh, party of regions, uh, and also many people from Donbas region. There were some uh, higher rank Russian officials present as well. This was a key event and it had the potential to break up Ukraine and to start proper civil war if it was a sort of separation of these eastern regions was developed. And uh, at the time, uh, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, the president of Ukraine, has fled Kiev and was in Kharkiv. So once he could come to this event uh, to play in his uh, legitimate position as a president, this would have very different consequences. But uh, fortunately, the meeting was uh, abruptly ended. Uh, the main delegates uh, left. And then this uh, Euromaidan uh, protesters, who you can see in the picture, marched to the city center. And it was really the atmosphere of victory and euphoria. And uh, they gathered in the central square 
and they are the first propositions to topple uh, these uh, huge uh, uh, monuments of Lenin. Uh, these plans were not implemented, and on the day, uh, Euromaidan protesters also peacefully occupied the, the regional administration building. But in the very uh, night, the first clashes with pro Russian or anti Maidan protesters took place. So the Kharkiv was actually the place where the so called Russian Spring of the Russian uprisings began. So overnight, there were um, a camp of defenders of Lenin erected around the monument. So, um, and it was there for several weeks. And uh, in one week, uh, uh, there was like the biggest anti Maidan protest in the, um, in the square. And you can see this uh, like joyful uh, protesters uh, to the right. And in the background, you can see the flag of uh, Russia, but as well as the Ukrainian Soviet Republic flag and uh, the Russian imperial flags. So this really shows that uh, Russian spring relied on the bricolage of symbols effectively combining the Soviet ones and the Russian imperial ones. So over here, the uh, Sovietophile and Russophile identities effectively merged together. And uh, this uprising was, uh, in this uprising, social media played a crucial role. And importantly, the ongoing events were tied together with the events of the Second World War. So on this uh, picture, you can see how uh, the moment when a protester who turned to be a, a pro-Putin activist from Russia replaced the flag, uh, of the Ukrainian flag on the administration building with the Russian one. It was uh, compared to the uh, placement to the, of the Soviet flag on the Reichstag building. And the text here says that Russians never start the wars, but they end the wars. So it really brings together the memory of the Second World War and ongoing events. And then, of course, uh, there are other uh, materials which uh, tie together and reinforced this, uh, this nostalgia for the Soviet times. So uh, on the one picture, you can see that uh, it's a Russian flag being built off the Soviet one. So it's apparently symbolizes the, uh, symbolized the Reemergence as uh, Russia of Russia as the new superpower, and to the right you can see a quite interesting map, which also has this geopolitical claim of uh, Russia expanding once again. So you can see that it includes not only it's the map, the territory of the former Soviet Union, but nearly all Eastern Bloc, uh, Finland, and even Alaska. So while claiming this Eastern Slavic uh, unity, it says Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are together. This also has this uh, geopolitical and territorial claims, which go far, far beyond the territory of contemporary Russian Federation. And then uh, social media also uh, created uh, like alternative reality. Uh, it could be com uh, compared with this Marvel uh, what if idea. So in this parallel universe, Yanukovych and uh, Putin are signing some agreements which uh, starts the Soviet Union 2.0. And of course, uh, the uh, bringing together like um, Soviet uh, past and, uh, and our present was all over the place. So Putin was, uh, in, like on, in this picture, but in many others, was presented as the Stalin of our days. So the text over here says that uh, seeing how Putin is being demonized uh, uh, now, I sort of start starting to believe that Stalin wasn't that bad. And then the question, the rhetorical question, that uh, how the Soviet Union could uh, win the war if uh, its leader was the tyrant and a dictator who hated his people. So in a way, it legitimizes both the Russian aggression against Ukraine 
but also uh, sort of very Stalinist in its essence. And uh, during the process, while initially supporting them, uh, Gennady Kernes uh, really uh, resisted the election of so-called people's uh, mayors and governors, which provided alternative uh, power structures. So at some point, the protest for Russian protesters visited the city council, and and then uh, he really resisted uh, this um, replacement of Ukrainian authorities with more like uh, Russian or poor Russian ones. And uh, later in April, he was actually shot and wounded and was uh, paralyzed since then. And uh, while the conflict in Donbas started getting momentum, there was also the war of monuments. So before the so-called decommunization laws were adopted by Ukrainian parliament in 2015, there were quite a lot of uh, Soviet era monuments uh, toppled by decommunization vigilantes, as I call them. So the monument I previously mentioned, this one to uh, Ukrainian insurgent army uh, fighters. At some point, it was uh, blown up with explosives, and later it was painted in, in the colors of the Polish flag. This was done also to stress that uh, UPA was involved in the uh, Volin massacre. So it's not only challenge um, Ukrainian like liberation struggle from the side of Russia, but also bringing the uh, uneasy uh, memory in terms of Ukrainian-Polish relations. And I particularly like this picture, it is uh, the toppled monument of uh, Rudnik, uh, who was the hero, the Soviet hero during the, the Civil War. So, and uh, on this, uh, the square was actually renamed after the heavily hundred, those who were killed during uh, Euromaidan protests. So it really shows how uh, central uh, spots was the Soviet names, but got new ones uh, after, after the Euromaidan revolution. And uh, yeah, some monuments were uh, removed uh, by the authorities, but generally there was resistance. And uh, many of monuments were toppled by uh, vigilantes. And this is also relevant to the uh, the Lenin Monument in the uh, Freedom Square, which was toppled in uh, September 2014. And for quite a while, its foundation remained in this very peculiar postmodern form. So you have uh, this uh, huge uh, foundation uh, covered with uh, uh, scaffolding, with this some sort of icon and uh, Ukrainian flag sticking in from one of the Lenin's shoes. Uh, later it was removed, and I will come back to this particular spot um, uh, a bit later. And uh, there were some members representing uh, Ukrainian right-wing organization, like this um, uh, Falcon organization as part of. Uh, but then there were several terror attacks, uh, uh, like the one in February 2015. It was when the local Yevromaidan activists wanted to commemorate, to mark the anniversary of Yevromaidan victory. And once they moved from this uh, sports palace uh, where this Eastern Front uh, meeting was taking place one year prior, there was a landmine uh, placed uh, on the road side. So it exploded and killed uh, three Yevromaidan protesters and highly ranked uh, police official. And where this terror attack took place, um, there was this uh, um, monument installed, created a new memory place uh, for Kharkiv. And one of those killed in this uh, terror attack was uh, Danilo Didik, a schoolboy uh, of pro-Ukrainian views. And uh, he became like a really iconic figure for the Ukrainian patriotic movement. And uh, there are uh, various events like concerts and football matches dedicated to his family. 
and uh, there is an uh, ongoing campaign to name the school where he used to go to name after him. But uh, uh, city authorities really resist this. In fact, what they do, they uh, while they allow some renaming, they really censor and not allowing very patriotic figures to become like uh, to uh, to make central uh, squares or avenues named after them. A uh, good example is, uh, for instance, one street was named after Ruslan Plachotko. Ruslan Plachotko was a military pilot, a helicopter pilot, whose helicopter was downed near Slovyansk in 2014. He was hardly born and went to uh, one of the schools. And near the schools, uh, the school, the street is renamed after him. But then the, there was a campaign to rename one of the avenues after Miroslav Misla. Miroslav Misla originally from Western Ukraine, but he uh, did the history course at Kharkiv National University. And he was a volunteer uh, uh, fighter associated with one uh, right-wing organization. He was killed. Uh, and uh, campaigners wanted to rename one of the central avenues after him, but the city authorities uh, never allowed this uh, to happen. So there is really censored. Uh, but uh, Euromaidan activists, uh, this is probably the biggest success of their efforts. It's uh, the Odoroblo on monstrosity case. So just behind where the Lenin Monument was, uh, Mayor Kermes uh, decided to implement a quite big project. So it was the idea by, not surprisingly, by the brother of the head architect of Kharkiv to build an 87 meter column uh, with uh, some figure with a cross on top of it. And it was met with immense resistance. First of all, it was seen as sort of replicating the similar column in, in St. Petersburg. And also it was untransparent and uh, generally perceived as a marker of the Russian world. So there was petitioning and uh, most notably there was a court case by local activists and it was prevented from happening. In fact, it's like for the first time in Gennady Kermes' uh, work as a mayor, he was prevented from implementing of, uh, his idea. It actually shows also some structural change, which is uh, happening in Kharkiv. But a bit later, uh, instead of this column, a uh, more natural project was completed. It's uh, the project of so-called uh, Dry Fontaine. Uh, it's actually removed uh, one of the monuments by uh, uh, Maidan activists. It wasn't uh, like approved monument, and it um, commemorated those who gave their lives in the conflict in Donbass. It was removed by authorities, and as you can see on the right, replaced with this sort of uh, space around the fountain. And it was the its opening took place last year in August. It was the last time when Gennady Kermes was uh, seen publicly. After this, he fell ill with COVID and died of it in uh, uh, last December. So in Kharkiv, there is uh, a mayoral uh, campaign in progress and uh, some, some memory is continued to be used about it. Most notably, this is the uh, or former Zhukov Avenue and his monument. So this uh, avenue was renamed after Petro Grigorenko, a dissident Soviet general, who actually was uh, one of the prominent figures of uh, or dissident movement in the Soviet Union. But uh, first Gennady Kernas uh, and now um, uh, the acting mayor uh, used uh, this uh, figure to mobilize their respective electorate. So for the third time, they uh, give back the name of Zhukov to this avenue. Then it's been challenged in courts and this ruling is uh, reversed. So it shows like really how 
the solid memory is used for mobilization uh, purposes. So the struggle uh, continues. And I was quite surprised to learn that uh, in Odessa, uh, mayor of the United Tukhanov does exactly the same. There is uh, Zhukov Avenue, uh, which has been uh, renamed, and Trukhanov uh, uh, makes all efforts to give it back its name. So it really shows how uh, to pull the strings and to appeal to this uh, Sovietophile identity in order to mobilize electorate. And then social media provides uh, not only serve as a tool of propaganda, but uh, they provide important space for collective memory work. For instance, uh, interesting uh, discussion was taking place in, uh, in discussing this picture from 1970s uh, Kharkiv. While many commentators are very nostalgic for this time and really, really present it in a very romanticized manner, uh, there is interesting intervention, intervention by one lady who emigrated to Israel uh, in, the, in the 70s. And uh, she actually provides a more critical uh, picture of uh, that historical period, pointing out that it was hard to live, there were deficits, deficit. And also she, she peeps off the systematic anti-Semitism which uh, existed in the Soviet Union. So this really shows how uh, this uh, dominant narratives are being disrupted by these critical interventions. And then there is nostalgia for more recent past. Actually, Kharkiv hosted, uh, during Yanukovych time, hosted one of the ma several matches of Europe 2012. And, um, and yeah, this is the parade of, uh, uh, of the uh, Dutch um, fans in Central Kharkiv. And, uh, and yeah, people uh, refer to this time as the time as, uh, of uh, stability and um, when it was like easier to live and survive. And uh, some even argue that this is the happiest time uh, which they remember. And many are very critical about the Romantan development. And then there is a super important initiative, uh, which is uh, uh, Kharkiv uh, Literary Residency. It uh, rents one of the apartments of, um, of the smaller house and allows uh, Ukrainian and not only uh, writers, poets uh, to come there and live and host different uh, events. So, and uh, present uh, their uh, work. But at the same time, it's quite often commemorates those prominent people who lived there in the 1930s and who were executed. And uh, while it's hard to tell whether this cultural, uh, this and other cultural initiatives uh, inspired the local authorities, but after one of the central parks, the Shevchenko Garden was redeveloped the figure of uh, Les Kurbas appeared in the central alley. Uh, Les Kurbas was a prominent uh, theatrical director who was executed in the Sandermach execution sites in Karelia in 1937. So it really shows how this uneasy memory is being addressed in this way uh, and how these grassroots initiatives help to reveal this uneasy past. But another example is not that positive. So as I mentioned, uh, Kharkiv was one of the uh, sites where Katyn executions uh, took place. And there is a mass grave uh, in, in, uh, in one of the parks. So in 1990s, the research was done and it is estimated that more than uh, 5,000 Polish soldiers and uh, officers were executed and are buried there. And also more than 3,000 of uh, citizens of the former Soviet Union were also killed and buried there. With the support of uh, mainly uh, Poland, the, uh, this uh, memorial was opened in, 2000, uh, in, in the year 2000 by Viktor Yushchenko and then Prime, uh, Prime Minister of Poland, Jerzy Buzek. It really has some inclusivity, so it has like not only Catholic, but also Orthodox crosses. But the main thing, of course, the main focus are on those Poles 
executed executed there. And uh, but you know the text on the foundation of this uh, uh, of the statue uh, provides us with very like post colonial evaluation of this event. So the text uh, reads as the following: Forgive us, our Polish brothers, for not understanding and being silent, uh, silent uh, when you were executed on our land. So discursively, this um, text actually takes the blame away from Ukrainians. So it's really presents as uh, Ukrainians as passive observers, but not those who in any way are guilty for these executions. And of course, more memory work and more revaluation of the role of Ukrainians in these uh, uneasy events is uh, needed. Uh, the discussion of Katyn is nearly absent from public debates in Kharkiv. You hardly can find any mentions on social media as well. So this, uh, the work with this uneasy memory uh, we, is really important for the future of, uh, of Kharkiv and Ukraine in general. So I think it's uh, something to consider in the future. So I will draw some conclusions. The changes of the Kharkiv memory scape affect both post-revolutionary developments, but also very uh, complex and interesting local dynamics of mobilization, power struggle, and contestation. And uh, social media, importantly, they, of course, could be manipulated, as we all know, but uh, they also provide many opportunities for previously marginalized groups to voice uh, some unpopular uh, ideas and to, to challenge uh, dominant narratives. And also, while there is a restorative Soviet nostalgia of 2014 has faded away, there are more um, opportunities for more reflexive and critical engagement with the past. And as I just uh, demonstrated, there is more could be done in this regard as well. And while memory is still used by local politician, politicians, its mobilizing uh, potential seems to be decreasing, which leaves, gives hope for more cons constructive public debates, commemoration practices, and dealing with the ghosts of the past. And just to briefly mention, uh, some of the of ideas of this talk will be in the forthcoming essay, uh, which will be published by Forum Trans Regionale in this uh, November. So I hope you will have the opportunity to read uh, some more about um, this in the coming November. So this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much.